<laughs> liquids. Liquids. You don't breathe them, because if you breathe them, you die, Amanda. Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, paper towels or tissues. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Man, three is sips this, in, and those, she is already toasted. It's one of those Jesus Christ days, Yom Kippur. It is one of those Jesus Christ Yom Kippur days. Oh, see, God is punishing me. Anyway. <laughs> it's not. I'm, I, I mean, I think, you I know, forgot what I was well. going to say now. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. <clears throat> oh, it was, we want to start. It's like I forgot how to drink. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I did that. I did that when I was twelve, and for years I used to just throw water in my mouth and hope I didn't choke to death. <laughs> but so, appa- you, so you had a drinking problem. I, I generally had a drinking problem, but apparently it could be. I know. You want me to run over to the drums? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> um, and one of the one of the. The, 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 when you're about that age, apparently the ability to suckle just turns off. At twelve. Yes. No. Seriously, weaning. You don't. You don't lose physically lose 12 the ability. Twelve years. Yes. So, is there something you want to tell us? You're all a bunch of fucking pricks. <laughs> Never mind. I'm sorry. That was me. What I'm <laughs> saying is. <laughs> what I'm saying is that my suddenly. Explain my inability to suck liquids into my mouth without just throwing them fucking in there. Oh, okay. Okay. God, I hate you. <laughs> Amanda, Amanda's okay. But you. No, you uh, can hate me too because that's where my mind I, went. I know, but I can't, okay? Because I'm stupid. All I, can, all I can think of is Game of Thrones now. Yeah. <sighs> I want out of this conversation. <laughs> well, fuck you and welcome to Penny After Dark. <laughs> We never actually introduced ourselves last time. No, we didn't, because I went to, and Curtis said, no, it'd be better without, then he put, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> what? Drink, drink, drink your beer, James. <laughs> Stop treating me like a fucking alcoholic, okay? <laughs> don't try to body, co- don't try to just pacify me with fucking drugs, okay? <laughs> I was just referring to the fact that it's really good beer. Okay, well, I'll try some. Stop, damn it. <laughs> Well, with that, on that cheerful it's note... It's pretty good beer. <laughs> mm. yeah. It tastes like cinnamon. It does. It tastes sort of like gingerbread. Mm. Except good gingerbread. It's it's Christmas in a glass. If it was Christmas in a glass, it would taste of three-day-old meat. <coughs> okay. Uh, tears. Okay, you yeah, always, always. Gas. A <laughs> little bit. And uh, the bitterness of having to deal with relatives you'd rather not see. <laughs> Can we substitute horseradish for that? Uh, you want Passover in a glass? Isn't that what... Well, wrong holiday, because Passover is Easter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is the lamb's blood gives it a really funny kick. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Ooh, a Passover beer would be interesting. It would just taste like beef brisket. You're right, that would be interesting. That'd be interesting. <laughs> It'd be interesting. I, I distinctly remember having Manischewitz wine, which is about as good as you'd expect anything made by Or you could do Egyptian New Year, which just tastes va- vaguely of Nile and sperm. <laughs> That's back, back, back in, back, back during the two kingdoms. <laughs> That's how uh, the year was given birth to. Uh, uh, I know. Okay. Yeah, we, we I'm know. explaining for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Explain to the children how, in the Egyptian New Year, the Nile would be fertilized by a man posing as their <laughs> god, who would masturbate into the waters that everyone swam, drink, and washed in. Mm-hmm. Yep. So ev- everyone had a little bit of him inside them. Hooray! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I do wonder how, like, Hat Shep's up and other... Splates virgin births. <laughs> I want out of this conversation. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, so, so, like, intros. <laughs> Talking yeah. of virgin births suckling beyond your years. Cats! <laughs> cats! 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 Amanda and knows all the about musical. these cats things. Well, I, I really appreciate how you actually introduced that into the intro, so I can't edit it out. Uh, uh, you're not going to fucking edit this. You gave up like three years ago. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing this for three years. Feels like it. Feels like it indeed. Uh, well, I love the, you know, uh, paraphernalia we've built up as well on the table. The paraphernalia? Yeah. 
We have a trilobite st- plush on the table. And stuff. And stuff. You mean beer glasses and... No, I mean like books and bits of paper and well, boxes no, and bags. Well, that, no, all that paraphernalia is me moving out. Yep. Hooray. Yay. Yay. Get work done. We're doubling shit up so that when <coughs> I move, this is all going to still be just fine. So if we make any topical references that are no longer topical by the time this comes up, like Yom Kippur... <laughs> Syria, which by now no longer exists as a country. Syria, we don't, Jesus, well done. Um, then we apologize. But not really. Yeah, not Because at all. she's a bad Jew. I am a bad Jew. It's okay. The point. So cats. 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 Uh, do we want to introduce the players again? What? I don't know. Who are Welcome you? to Paleo After Dark. I'm Kurt. Amanda. James. Hi. And, and the loser gets their game pieces destroyed. And the loser does get their game pieces destroyed. <laughs> I didn't realize this was a fight to the death. <laughs> oh. This is the Game of Thrones you win or you lose. <laughs> game of Thrones podcast. Not actually about the Game of Thrones. Just or- acted like the Game of Thrones. Yes. Oh, so many things I could say right now that I'm not going to. Why not? Somebody needs to bring the comedy. You haven't read the last two books, that's why not. Which would you... Um, I, th- I think it would be probably really, really bad <laughs> to reference anything that would be coming in subsequent seasons that people... It's wouldn't... already happened. Oh, it's already happened? Yeah. Oh, you're just going to make wedding jokes? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, I know about that. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you knew it. I, I mean, I haven't read the last two books, like the one that he wrote last year and the year before. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, aren't they getting dangerously close to the point where no, fuck it, cats? No, because the, thir- <laughs> the third book, the the third book, only half the third book is this season, and so they're hanging out fourth season. Only finished the third book. I've read the first five, and there's seven now. There's five. There isn't. Yeah. No, there's more than that. He's written more. There's five books. No, there's fuck more. Fuck if I know. <laughs> um. Oh God, are we fact checking? No. We're fact checking Game of Thrones. No. No. So cats, why don't, why don't cats, you introduce this paper really... seeing as you made us read it? Yeah, really. <laughs> it's all your goddamn fault. So God cats damn it! Are... Work! So cats are fun. Game of like, Thrones. I honestly thought this would be great. Like, Game we of... basically interrupt this podcast the entire time to talk about cats, right? That's like, pretty cat- much. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably just going to end up telling stories about you know cats the entire time. Books. <laughs> Such. So, yeah, there's this uh, study that we all looked into, which uh, is a recent study trying to see if you could uh, map habitat preference for various groups of cats to Wikipedia. lengths of their bones. Shut up. And Amanda is triumphantly holding up. Five books. Five books. And Seven. Wait. Seven books until he's done with the goddamn series. There's only five out. Okay, well, I've read all of them then. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um I like once again we were both right. God damn. No, it. you weren't. <laughs> You're not anywhere near uh anyway. So, yeah. Cats. So, and it's not just cats. It's um specifically looking at Felidae, which Fila is the definition of cats. Which is the definition. No, because you have Feliformids. So, it's, it's so wait, what, okay, well, let, let, let's back up just a little bit of uh, vertebrate systematics. What is the difference between Felidae and your Feliforme and other things like that? <coughs> okay, I have to step back. This is like an entire year since I've Generally, this. the way I understand it, if it's a form, if it's got form at the end, it's a bullshit thing that means things that look like whatever the thing in front of it is. So they're things that look like cats, and Felidae will be actual cats. Okay. Amanda, how accurate is that assessment? Probably fairly accurate, but it's been a while, like I said, since I actually went back and looked at it. I okay, guess so we're going to tentatively she, she trust will, she'll James. She'll Google yeah. the number of Game of Thrones books, but she won't Google cats. Because the game, number of Game of Thrones books is relatively <laughs> simple to Google. I was going to say, here's the thing. We only fact check the important facts. Exactly. As oh, opposed man. to the science, what we're talking about. God, of course. Yeah, well, that's up to our listeners to fact check themselves. The listener? <laughs> the listener, yes. Um... So, it, and it's not just looking at modern cats, it's looking at several fossil groups as well, including some um, scimitar and dirk tooth cats, which are the two groups of saber tooth cats. Mm-hmm. So there's and a false dirk tooth. Oh, that's right, and a false dirk tooth. What, what, what's, so why is it a false dirk tooth? Because it's not really a dirk tooth cat. 
So why don't we, I guess, back up a right. bit and just talk about saber tooth cats. cats. What are what are dirk tooth? What saber tooth? What's all that mean? So um, it's, a, it's a southern northern. Split. No, it's not. No, no, it's not at all. Okay, because um, I know because uh, uh, most of what we think of as saber tooth cats are dirk tooth cats because they're right. the ones we know the most. Like Smilodon. Yeah. So dirk tooth cats are the cats that have the really really long sabers. Okay. Um, Smilodon, um, Barbophilus, which actually isn't a cat; it's a Barbophilid, but um, it's um, it's a um, it's kind of vaguely related to cats. Um, and so these guys have the really long sabers, okay. and they have really short legs. And they're slightly... They're, the they're sabers, stumpy. But the, the, the sabers are, are slightly curved? No. No, they're straight. No, they're, that's no, no, straight. no, no, no. They're, they're curved. They're really curved. They're okay. really curved. Okay. Really okay. curved. Okay, and that's why they're the dirk. Yes. Rather than a saber. Because a, a dirk is a, sor- is a knife that's nice. curved. Yeah. yeah. Used usually for parrying and... And, and, and ripping out combat. people's throats. Yeah. Yeah. So good. There, yeah. Larry would always demonstrate this in class. It was would great. demonstrate I, I, ripping out someone's throat. Well, no, in class. he would. No, he would. He would I've not really one. demonstrate it, but he was. He would discuss the correct methodology. I believe his exact words were, "If you ever just slice someone's throat like this, and you would mime just drawing a straight blade across the throat, mm-hmm. he'd say you're not really slitting someone's throat. You're giving them a tracheact, a tracheotomy. Yeah, a lot of people. You want to you, the carotid. You get back here. Yeah, right so back here. And so that, yeah, and that's, that's why, why they the have tip, that curved the, yeah, blade. Yeah, and the tip goes in, and rather than cut, you sort of just rip Pull, it. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's dirk tooth cats. They've got. So r- this is once again information for the kids, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's important, um, especially all those German children that need to learn dueling in school. <laughs> Wait, German children learn dueling? They might do. It's still um, a big thing in universities. I, I read mean, an article on it. Anyway, so that's and so dirt two cats have really really long teeth and really really short legs. That's the really simplified version of it. And then um, scimitar tooth cats have relatively straight teeth. They're pretty coarsely serrated, so they've got jagged edges, um, and they're relatively short teeth. I mean, they're still flattened and blade like and huge compared to the rest of the teeth in the mouth, and they have longer limbs. Okay. And there was some there was some debate as to whether these are just the ancestors to dirt tooth cats, which I think Larry always said they weren't. And no, recent they recent weren't. analysis has said they're not either. Yeah. Um and, and then there's weird things like well, the um, Lacosmyris, because you've got the Lacosmyris is a saber tooth marsupial. Yeah. Which is saber tooth awesome. marsupial? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I remember there was a talk a while ago that I went to a guy talking about potential like deep seated parallelisms within animals. And thinking that maybe canines like, always vary a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yeah. like examples of of of, of saber or dirk tooth kind of uh, anatomy yeah. being potentially a deep seated uh, yeah. developmental parallel. Which makes sense because saber tooth cats have evolved and gone extinct. I think at least five times. Yeah. So this is the thing um, to remember as well that they're yeah, not they're very they're, they're, cats. We're, we're talking about an ecophenotypic thing. Yes. Rather the, the, than the, a, the, rather than a the a, actual a, size of the tooth might yeah. not necessarily And, and this is the thing clade. to bear in mind about all cats as well. Everyone's canines are slightly enlarged, but all cats have enlarged canines yes. in relation to the, the, the standard dentition. The difference is not in the size of the canine. That's not what makes a saber tooth cat. Um it's, right? it's the cross section. Yeah. It's the flattening of the tooth that makes a saber tooth cat. If you look at clouded leopards for their skull size, they've got ridiculously sized canines. They're also one of the cutest things on the planet. They really are adorable. Wait, that's not the point. So we're, we're, um, we're, what are these things? Clouded leopards are almost leopards? extinct. Yeah, so Google them now. Uh, you are, Google them now because otherwise they'll be extinct. Well, I was going to say, on the internet anymore. Go, go, so as soon as you're extinct, Google, you Google them now and donate. Okay. okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, are they similar to snow leopards? Like, again, vaguely. nearly 20 or 30 leopards. Yeah, left except if you imagine. Um, they're, they're, they're super small and fluffy. Yeah. In comparison, I mean, snow leopards are fluffier. super fluffy. No, no, they're fluffy. These are fluffy. Okay. Yes. This is this Seriously. is becoming in my head like a giant fur ball. It That's pretty about much right. is. They're like the cutest thing. They're really adorable. Um, okay. The person I want to do a postdoc with has actually dissected one because it was at a zoo and it died. Because they have no soul. And she got to dissect one. Because they have no soul. You it only... died of natural causes. Now, and t- talking of things big in zoos is something we can discuss when we go into the study a bit. Um, this doesn't, I mean, this looks cute and little leopardy, but it's not like fluffy. I mean, it's cute. They're pretty fluffy. I mean, yeah, sure. They're fluffy. Um. They've got really awesome, like the, the spots, the way the, the spots go are really like crazy and marbled yeah those are cool yeah you so anyway that's not a clouded leopard. that's not a clouded leopard yeah that is i mean that's that's what you come up with when you see wikipedia's entry of clouded leopard that's a clouded leopard um have i been lied to no um 
Google Snow Leopard. So, um, so anyway, so um, they've got huge canines for their skull size. Okay. But their teeth are shaped like cones. They're conical toothed cats, so they cannot be saber toothed cats. Okay. So it's not necessarily the size of the tooth, it's the shape. Okay. So if you're a specific shape, it's just not possible to to evolve that kind of... No, no, no. It is possible. Um, because obviously the saber teeth had to evolve from conical teeth. Okay. But, but they're, they're... And any ancestors to a non-saber tooth probably had a flattened tooth beforehand? Um, no. No. No? Okay. Then I don't know where this conversation went. <laughs> we were talking about the differences between... Okay. Can you say what kind of tooth is a standard tooth? What kind of tooth is a standard tooth? Yeah. It's a, it's a cone tooth. Yeah, but if it's if it's cone shaped, what is it? Conical. Thank you. I did wonder about that. Yeah. What conical. were you wondering about? Because she kept saying conical. Okay. Did I, I? Yeah, I wondered if that was conical. an American conical. thing. Conical. No, American no, thing. I, I'd always said conical. Yeah, it's supposed to be conical. I was just okay, talking fast. Okay, cool. That's cool. I just wondered. It's, um, a, it, it's totally conical, dude. Oh, come on. Stop staring daggers at me like that. Really, over that? that that's More what ducks. This... Oh, well, no, that was not well done. I did not even deserve that response. <clears throat> anyway. Um, so that is what we is looking, discussing. We is yeah. looking is discussing. Indeed. I'm speaking like a lolcat. I, I shall speak this. as a lolcat for the rest of this podcast. <laughs> uh, Fuck me. God, <laughs> God, really? You're walking home. <laughs> Why? Because. Can I has ride? Oh, no. um, <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm tempted to make you swim home. How? How? Break his legs. That's... Well, the one, f- Amanda, way bigger than you. Like, see so you try. <laughs> not the point. Two, why would you do that to me? Three, not in lolcat. I, I, fuck that. <laughs> Shepard. <laughs> you want I could talk like my vulture character from my writing competition from yon- yonks ago. Oh, do you want the what? I uh, had an Egyptian vulture character, so he talked in a really racist accent. Oh yeah, that, we we might just need to bleep every word you say afterwards. So okay, so those are cats. Yes, those are cats. What those was were... the study in particular looking at? The study in particular was looking at what was advertisers looking at, and what was it actually looking at. Oh fuck off! <laughs> well, it was advertisers looking at variation in postcranial material, specifically in the limb. L- the you mean specifically limb, the humerus? Yeah, the that's humerus all they looked specifically. At. Yes, yeah. they um, tried to be humorous about it. Was, it. it was a test study, essentially. Yeah. Okay, uh, what's the word? Proof of concept. It was a proof of concept, yes. Trying to um, look at um, habitat, essentially. Um, yeah, it was trying to see if there were characteristics of the bone that mapped out consistently with habitat. Yeah, yeah. either terrestrial, scansorial, or arboreal. So well, either ground well. No, well, no, no, no. no. Really. Open, close, or mixed. Yeah. 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 Which is proxies, but we'll get into why that's... Not. Well, there are two issues I had with the way they did that later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, what I will say, as far as my opinions of the study, I thought it was very interesting. I don't know if the results mean anything, but I thought it was very interesting. It is. And that, that's really not as mean as, I, as, I, as it sounds. I really think the ideas of what they're trying to do are very interesting. It's very cool to see correlation. Very cool to see correlation. Very yes. cool to see correlation. It's possible, though, because of the ways they're defining everything, yeah. the correlations they're getting could be just entirely spurious. Yeah, and yes. you'd want to you want to compare amongst more than just one group of animal, and you want to compare amongst more than just one bone. Well, I mean, I think with their interests, what they were going for was yeah. to try and... And again, I guess I'm going to tie this into the introduction of the paper again. Their interests were to see if we have fossil cats, just specifically yeah. fossil Can cats. Can we tell what environment? Exactly. Yeah. And, and and the really interesting thing they were trying to do with it was not only were they taking whole bone, but they were also taking like fragmentary parts and dividing their data set up about uh, according yeah. to that. Yeah. Under the assumption that you might only get like half of the humerus. Yeah, it's yeah. not very common. You Often you'll just get bone. the uh, either end because it's the thickest part of the bone, right? Yep, exactly. And so they wanted to see if there was any possible information that could be gleaned yeah. from that. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, one thing that I was confused about when I was reading was they talk about doing a log, dis- um, um, a linear discriminant analysis, and then they say, well, because of these differences in size that we have, we're going to end up with these problems. Why didn't they log adjust they their did. data? They did log adjust their data. Everything was yeah. log adjusted. And it's, then it's even weirder because in the, in the methods, they talk about doing this LDA, this, um, linear discriminant analysis, and then they say, well, then we, so we broke out, 
the small specimens and did it, and we broke out the large specimens and did it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I didn't understand, because then I was reading further. I'm like, hey, you guys long adjusted the data. They Well, here's the thing. Huh. What they wanted to do is they wanted to see which method worked best. So they did that because, they, they first of all, they wanted, to, they wanted to look at do ratios tell us anything, and then do pure lengths tell us anything and then do pure lengths log adjusted for size variation tell us anything and that's ah. why that's the middle step the okay let's use the real measurements rather than ratios but let's see um but because of the big size discrimination the smallest cats are your bit but tabby cat size and uh, right. smilodon was a 400 pound monster yes yeah. um <laughs> They they needed to split them. They arbitrarily split them in half based on so that the, they would all plot within the same graph. Well, and they reference right there in the very beginning that uh, part of an issue that might come up in the data is that uh, there seems to be, or at least what they define as a hard set division between cats less than seven kilo, seven, seven kilos, which could potentially be arboreal and thus like are more likely to probably be in. If they are arboreal, they're more likely to be in closed, quote-unquote, tree environments. They basically had closed environments as being areas that were mostly arboreal or tropical. Yeah. Uh, whereas there might be an autocorrelation with larger cats not being able to climb. And so... But we know... But we but know like, that larger... Well... They were, what they were doing... This is the one... The slight problem with the way they did things is they had data, and then they used that data to inform how they broke things up, and then their data showed that the way they'd broken it up was more or less accurate. Yes, there are potential issues with that, although they didn't necessarily take the data that way. No. Their seven kilo was, was someone else's... Uh... Yeah, but I mean, one of those things is there's this there's this magical round number which most mammals sit at, and then anything else is really big and unusual. And I, seven kilos might be around that point. Yeah. Because mammals started out small. Most mammals still are small. Still are small. Most mammals still are small. Yeah. We're, we're, it's... Bizarre to think of us as a big mammal, but, but we are. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, okay. We we also may or may not have helped kill all the other big mammals. Not all yes. of them, but we definitely tried. A lot. Although most recent studies are suggesting that climate change did it. Of course, driving whole herds off the cliff probably helped. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we we were a stressed factor. Yes. And we were probably like following climate change to our quote unquote preferred environment. Yeah. Yes. As we then hunted the mastodon and the mammoth to extinction. We're great. We're we're really good at Such what we do. Such a great fucking species. Uh, here's the thing. No, we are great. Might not be very moral. We are great. <laughs> <laughs> are you going for human exceptionalism? Think of the things we've done. He's English. Of course he is. Think of the... Wait, <laughs> what? Come on, come on. Do you know these two bumps in the back of your head? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, they would be in the front of the head and like an Isaac Newton... Yeah. And this, 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 this is why you know exactly how much money is in your pocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you see, in you, the, on the back of the head, areas which are typically known for obedience, loyalty. <laughs> the hell is that from? Fucking Django Unchained. I man. still have not seen that. He's got it on DVD. It's, it's, a good, it's one of the few DVDs that's come out recently. So probably gonna get. No, it is really, 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 I've really heard good. It's really good. I need to see it. Yeah, you do. Anyway, not the point. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, um, totally. This is now the Django Unchained podcast. <laughs> We're now going to talk about Django Unchained to ruin it for Amanda. We're Aww. now going to bring in two people in order to have a live Mandingo wrestling, com wrestling competition. <laughs> wrestling, so. wrestling, wrestling. Good call, good call. Pull it back, pull it back. Um, so, okay, where were we? Um, uh, we were cats. Cats, 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 cats seven kilos. Cats seven and kilos. seven kilos, yes. yes. So, so yeah, your cat is more likely to be on the ground because he weighs too much. <laughs> Actually, that's accurate. <laughs> Actually, it is. Yeah. Because he weighs just over seven kilos. So, I think the thing... Actually, he might weigh seven exactly. There are, there are, two, there are two ways to break up the, what they did with the study. One was in terms of what they measured and how and why. Mm -hmm. And the other one is how they broke up the environment. So exactly. That, which we want, we want to discuss first. Let's start with the humorous, and then we'll go into... <laughs> you know, the serious? Yeah, we'll go into the serious. <laughs> I already made that shitty joke like 20 minutes ago. It doesn't matter. We're going to be making it over I made and over it better. <laughs> I took your joke. I made it better. <laughs> God damn it. Uh-huh. Uh, Only the best. And by that, I mean whatever the fuck we the have. Best. <laughs> don't st we're going to get us sued. Stop. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, right? I don't think it was going to sue me for attempting to sing a song. Well, maybe they'll sue me to stop. Yeah, no, that's might. why you sue anyone or anything. Okay. 
So Cat. they specifically picked the humorous. Yes. Yes. And they picked it because they gave several explanations as to <clears throat> why subtle variations of the Which... humorous or or other bones that affect the humorous are directly related to elements of mobility and locomotion. Now, one of the key things to remember in terms of cats is cats are generally forelimb and jaw predators. Forelimb yes. and jaw. Oh, you mean they, a, will, they, will, they, they, they grab they, things? They, yeah. they grab things and then smother usually. Yeah. Um, whereas if you look at birds naturally, you'd expect they hind are limb. the hind limb yeah. by and large. Yeah, they rake. Um, with their dogs hind limbs. are entirely jaws. You yes. Know. Um, bears. bears are fucking everything. Yes. Well, the bear is a giant. Bears are actually tank. primarily forelimbs. They kill you with the forelimbs and eat you with their jaws. Yes. <laughs> we we have um this is a bit of a sidetrack. We have a, a giant Arctodus humerus. Mm-hmm. That we pulled off the Kansas River. Somebody brought it in for us. And it's so explain what an Arctodus is. Ar- Arctodus is the short faced bear. Okay. Um, take a grizzly bear and add on another, like, I think six or seven feet. And okay. you have a short faced bear. Just huge monster predator that was around when humans started coming in. Mm-hmm. How Probably we... ate berries and no, then was no, murdered. No, no, <laughs> no. Just sitting there innocently going, no. Pick a man, Baskets, I hope humans don't come. And then... <laughs> no, Ar- Ar- hey, boo boo. <laughs> Arctodus was very much a predatory bear. There, you can you can look at the dentition and and weathering of the teeth, and you can actually go. This bear was more Yogi. I don't think you're supposed to eat the ranger. Yeah, the bears and are the most terrifying things to watch run. Are, and Arctodus, yeah, it's a very, fucking yeah. tank. And, it's and, a walking if you, tank. If you scale up a badger, yeah, and Arctodus had very long limbs. Yeah. It was it was a, a running bear, pretty much. Okay, just terrifying animal. Um. I mean the the like, humorous like the carnivorous horse. The humorous that we <laughs> there have was a carnivorous horse that oh, was yeah, pulled yeah. off the river has to be about three feet or so long. Okay, just an enormous upper arm bone. We we get cave bears in England, not anymore, but and they're bigger than the grizzly, but they're not as big as not as big Arctodus. as our Arctodus. I think is the largest place to see bear. Okay, I, need I to, believe one thing I need to do is find either the person or the gravestone of the person who named direwolves and high five them. <laughs> canis, canis Dyrus? Yes. Just high five. Di- are you, are you going to dig the body it. up? Dire, dire wolves. Dire wolves are like your classic mythology of like big, dangerous wolves. Yeah. And somebody uh... found a big wolf and named it a dire wolf. That's pretty awesome. Also, um, I think I've got this on DVD, but there was a program in England back when I was growing up called the uh, Velvet Claw. And it was basically looking at evolution and the concept being that predation. In competition drove evolution. It was following predators. And this is why I know about the carnivorous horse and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But this was before computer graphics. So you'd have terrifying shell sated watership down style uh, animals tearing each other apart and blood going everywhere. So and then like, this so carnivorous like, horse with blood dripping from his mouth just panting and staring at you. So this so, is what you see when you close your eyes. Yeah. So, this, okay. so this is like the animated version of watership down. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so humorous. Anyway, yes, yes. So they use the humorous <laughs> of the cat. Sorry, I got sidetracked. No problem. Um, bears are fun. Bears are fun. Um, I mean, the humorous is what the it's the the thickest, most robust bone in the forelimb. And it it is relatively highly variable. I mean, if you. It's the main. It's, it, it's no. It, it's not the main load bearing one because it's, it's all on here, isn't it? No, no. It is. Is it? it depends on. Well, it kind of depends on your posture. Okay. Um, it does tend to be the main load bearing because if you look at the joint, oh, if you're going to the, if the, you're climbing, all the muscles are up here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, On the humerus, for those that can't see me, the, the humerus, as in the upper arm, as opposed to yeah. the lower arm. If you're climbing, you want a very mobile wrist. That's actually why we have all the rotational mobility in our wrists. That it's we kind have. of gross. It's just two bones rolling around each other. Yep. Four actually. Well, I'm thinking specifically of these. Oh, two. the radius and ulna. Yeah. Yeah, yeah radius um, and ulna. But. Uh, if you look at the ulna, which is the bottom bone in your arm, mm-hmm. um, there's the um, um, I'm going to slaughter. The pronunci- no, there's no. A, that's on your knee. I know it's the, um, the tether of your arm. I'm going to slaughter this pronunciation because I always slaughtered, but it's um, the olecran, the the um, I, I want to say it, it's, it's the acceler- acceleron process. I think is how you say it. I'm not sure. It's this little projection. Yeah. On the ulna, and I can I can spell it's it. The elbow horns. Yeah, I can spell it, but I can never actually say it um and so that um is what you hit when you hit your funny bone okay yeah Mm -hmm. um and so when you look the actual load bearing is going to be coming mostly from the humerus okay um and not from the forearm 
I say, so as far as an assumption that locomotion and the humerus are something that is intrinsically linked, decent? If you're going to pick a bone, yeah. I mean, it'd be good to have the entire fall in, but seeing as they're specifically testing and, and, and recognizing that complete bones of large apex predators are very rare, exactly. the humerus is a good one to pick. Yeah, humerus is... It, well, it's Especially than... if you're looking at locomotion and something that's postcranial because too much of mammals focuses on the head. Yeah. And, and so for this study, they looked at modern bones to try and develop a model. Yeah, they did some fossil stuff too. They did add some fossil stuff in later as like yeah. a test of their model, but yeah. their, their model was based entirely off of modern bones. Yes. And uh, with that, they mostly used complete specimens. Yep. And then they also broke up, they, they ran through three different trials. One of measurements from the entire humerus, mm -hmm. And one of measurements from one area and another area. Yeah, either the proximal or closer closer part of the body or the distal or more further away mm -hmm. apart from the body. Yeah. And use that to try and see if they could find any like strong statistical significance that was preferential to one side or okay. the other. Mm -hmm. Here's one uh, the, one of the interesting studies I noted was that it was the one person doing all of the measuring. And they measured each one, each bone three different times with a bit of space in between each one to see how reliable they were as a measurer. And... One person generated 5% disparity between measurements each time. No one ever bothers to do that. It's a very interesting yeah, thing yeah, that's, to Yeah, that's not at all surprising. I've, I've been reading studies that, because um, I've been looking at shrinkage rates in spe uh, museum study skins. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, there are studies and, and people are saying, well, this is the only way we can do things, but we really can't be certain about shrinkage rates all, all the time because different people are measuring these specimens. Yeah. And so one person can have this much error and the other person could have this much error. The, the other sad thing is that some people would measure your um, ulna without counting the projection at the bottom because that's really a projection and other people would include it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's a problem. Okay. But it's very interesting that they, they actually did that in order to give that extra level of robustness mm -hmm. to try to remove any um, measuring error, which a lot of people don't bother to do. Yeah, no, I, I think the... Uh, that's, the <clears throat> that's a really good mark on the paper. The, the thing that I do like about the way the paper was entirely written up is that they everything that they come across is very blatant and very easy to understand as far as each step that they took and why. Mm -hmm. And their justifications for doing one thing over another are easily explained so that you I mean, can refute or, they, or they agree. They spit all their fucking results out at you and, and I got <laughs> lost in the swamp of that. But <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually, there's a lot of data. I actually like that because... It's, they're going, look, here's all of our stuff. We're not hiding anything exactly. from you. No, no, exactly. No, it's yeah, very good. It's but you, you need someone. This is, what, this is why you don't like my writing. <laughs> I'll try to, to guide people through to like, okay, this is everything. And then these are the key points, which was their discussion section. Exactly. Yeah. But getting through the results was a bit of like, oh, my God. So so they established the humerus as being the bone that they wanted to look at because yep. you can't look at the entire animal or maybe we'll only get a humerus here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they wanted to divide up habitats. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, hang on. Talking about how they measured or where they got their samples from. Okay. A couple of interesting points I thought. First of all, they, they used uh, captured zoo animals for, for some of them. Yes. Especially rare ones. That's absolutely fine. But they, a couple of times they said... If we couldn't get the left, we measured the right because we ascertained there's no big variance between the two. That's fine. But we know from a number of captive animals that they develop bizarre pathologies, especially mm -hmm. if they will always walk around the pen in a certain way. Yes. And one side will be... But they said in their said, uh, what it said as well that they throw out anything with obvious pathologies. Yes. And they would have been okay. complete skeletons. So that's kind of accounted for. Yeah. The two other things is, one, they used the, the wild cat. And the wild cat is currently suffering from massive interbreeding issues with domestic species okay um so there i don't know how much variability was added to their wildcat species through that but that's probably neither here nor there because they're close enough to obviously interbreed yeah well and i wonder that might also depend on how old these specimens that they use that was another point uh which oh, we'll get into uh, in a second from fossils development the, the the other thing was that no no no, not development what age like yeah. how what year did they collect the yeah specimens? you might get populations changing uh, okay. But then developments other things as well. The other thing yeah. is they, they took a lot of what were trophy specimens. Those are going to be the biggest, most robust animals. They actually, yeah. they, they expressly they state, state yeah. that because the majority of specimens they could get were trophy animals, yeah, that be... meant that there was intrinsically a bit of a bias in sampling size towards yeah. larger open plains yeah. animals. Larger open plains, probably males. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing... Again, people... 
We're dicks. Yeah. We have seven polar bears stuffed in our museum. Yeah, I know. We're not, dicks. One, not one. Entire family is probably not all the same family. <laughs> Um, well, what's the Futurama joke? Can't kill one, got to wipe out whole families. <laughs> can't leave orphans. Yeah, that was that was Kirk's mistake. Yeah, leaving orphans. Leave, leaving leaving anyone alive because then they'll hate you and come back in the second movie. Yeah, it's true. That's <laughs> uh, totally true. But or they'll just come back because they're supposed to come back because that's what happened in the original second movie. Stop bringing your fucking propaganda into this podcast, Curtis. <laughs> God damn it. The other thing from a developmental perspective, which my brain is stuck in at the moment. A is little bit? Re- relative, relative bone changes during growth. And did they, I don't recall. Did they state that they used? No, but that's not even the problem. The problem is looking at fossil species. If you don't recognize uh-huh. it's an adult, you're going to get, you might get weird lengths. But no, that's... you'll, you'll recognize that it's not an adult if it's a fossil because when, when, in the humor eye, there are the bone caps were not fused, and you, they're looking at the distal end, the yes, distal and but proximal ends. This is assuming that you say that, okay? You say that. I there say are, that because it's right. No, you say that because you know that a lot of people describe shit that don't know jack shit. Uh, is what I'm saying. But my point they is, ver- is that this this is a very long study. They personally verified every specimen. They did. They, they did. personally verified the taxonomic assignment of every specimen. This would have taken them a long time. It's the way to do it. They got one paper out of this. This is why most people will go off literature measurements and it will not be as good. That's true. Good point. That's something to think about if you're using a pure literature. Yeah, okay, but search. my I mean, I'm sorry, I thought... But my point is, this paper did it the right yeah. way. Yes. But yes. anyway, so, with yeah. all of these specimens, yeah. they did measurements of the humerus at, over various different areas. Uh, and as had divided up their measurements so that they could have a whole humerus data set uh, and a... Um, and also a like partial humerus data set. And then they decided also to do whole measurements, as in just the, the straight lengths, mm-hmm. and ratio measurements. Now, why would you want to do ratio measurements? Ratio is a way of correcting for size bias. Yes. Exactly. Uh, as things are getting larger, potentially there are certain things that are biasing size in your data set mm-hmm. overall else. The, uh, big things will invariably statistically swamp out everything else because those numbers are, are higher because... When you do it statistically, it doesn't care that these are biological animals. They're just pure numbers, and big numbers always swamp out little numbers. Exactly. So um, they took those humorous measurements, and then they wanted to compare those. Yeah, they're very humorous measurements. (laughs) I'm I'm trying not to do it every time, but occasionally it just gets me. (laughs) I know, I know. Well, you're just thinking of, you know, hitting your funny bone, as Amanda said. No, but it's not the humorous. I know, that's the problem, It's the ulna. That's why it's very sad for people that are very literal. God damn it! I, as the only vertebrate paleontologist here, this is this is getting painful for me. Oh, it's not humorous. Oh, god damn it! Here's so they took these they took these uh, assessments of habitat as well. <laughs> god damn it! <laughs> habitat. They they yes. they, they like I yeah. tried to estimate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they they used much like in the humorous. God damn it. That was so good because James didn't laugh. Amanda just broke out. Okay, anyway. Much like what they did with the humorous where they did uh, various parts and also various types of measurements, they also tried to establish habitat in four different ways. Yes. So two of them were just like broad strokes categorizations. Like The yeah. first one was uh, like, what was it? Like a mathematical? They, 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 they looked to see whether so or not... What some... it was was pure similarity it's what we would call yeah. phonetics yeah. and it was done exactly the right way which is just add a minus thing so you get this random arbitrary figure that apparently tells you something so if you were in like three forest biomes that was plus three for closed but and if, if you, you were, were in two savannas that yeah. was minus two and then for you were open, three fifths and so you were a plus forest. one and that meant that you were closed because you weren't zero so they, they basically had all positive numbers and their numbers were closed all negative were open and zero was mixed why? Why are you not stopping laughing? <laughs> and now you're making Amanda laugh because <laughs> Amanda got it and you didn't. I didn't hear it. You said three and then two, and I'm not saying you're three fifths forest. Ah! Uh, <laughs> damn it! Damn. Anyway, so yes, so yes, um, that was the w- one way of doing it. The interesting thing was how they collected that data. Either they they directly observed, or they had to use the endangered species guide. Yes. Uh, a lot of it, though, was just direct observations yeah. of this thing yeah. lives here and this thing lives uh, here. The yeah. second thing was, was 
doing those exact same measurements, but only using the endangered species guide. Which yeah, I that, the second one was when that they... Is, that is interesting, actually. They just explicitly were like, experts say it's closed. Mm-hmm. Experts say it's mixed. How accurate is this? Mm-hmm. Uh, then their next two I thought were more interesting, but they were more down on them. So they used they used a form of niche modeling, right? They did not use a form no, of no, niche no, modeling. No, 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 no. It wasn't niche what modeling. What they it used was... is they, they, they took a an overlay... Of the mm-hmm. entire of, of the, all the range that they had, uh, which was put out by the World Wildlife Federation, mm-hmm. I believe, and um, and it basically gives what if you get the wrong website, you're going to get very different data. WWF. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, World Wrestling. Fe- oh yeah, World Wrestling Federation. Wrestling. <laughs> God damn it! Well done. Just a bunch of guys wrestling donkeys. Oh yeah, <laughs> gonna save some koalas. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Randy Matt. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and they basically had a, an overlay in GIS, Geographic Information System. That's why. Sorry, that's why I got fuddled. Because of course, Paleo GIS is one of the major ways you uh, visualize range data in the, um, in the and, past. And, yeah, yes. in the past, and of course. That is often used in conjunction with uh, niche, niche modeling, modeling stuff, and yeah. that's why I made yeah, the no, erroneous the, 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 This was just uh, strictly they mapped out ranges yeah. of, yes. the, of the animals, and they had an overlay which was basically dividing the earth into biotas. Yes. So lower biomes, I should say. So this yeah. is a forest. This is a, and yeah. they basically, I think they probably rasterized their data. So by rasterizing, I mean they they took all of. Actually, they said they didn't shape, but they did. They did manage to use that data to uh, get an <laughs> estimate of how much of that area was covered over by either what they deemed for they, they did it in two ways they had it between forests and mm, like and grassland. grasslands yeah yeah oh and then they also divided it up between open and closed like the broad categorizations of open and closed versus mm-hmm. forests and grasslands mm-hmm. and that's what they did yeah. yeah i could see why they'd be down on that there, there's there's biases in there of if you've got a uh, just, yeah, the, their, their yeah. big bias there was that you have a big problem with uh, museum collections not adequately giving you good representative yes. collection data. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the the other big problem is your range might include grassland and forests, but you might be a species that's fucked clinging onto the two little bits of forest in the middle of a grassland. Well, and, that is true too. Mm-hmm. Like if you if you are just a series of pockets in yeah. forest, yeah. If you're but if you connect your range together, yeah. it looks like you're in mostly grassland yeah. because you're just separated out yeah. and about ready to die. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, but I, I think it was a very interesting way to try and quantify something. Yeah, it is very difficult to quantify. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's why I thought it was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because given the, 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 the simple positive or negative method, I, I definitely think that's an improvement. The positive or negative method, basically, what you're going to end up doing is, unless you're overwhelmingly one or the other, you're going to be pushed towards being a mixed just because of the, the sh- rule of, law of averages. Yeah, and I mean, if you've got maybe seven biomes that you're in, yeah. then there's no way you can be mixed according to the classification. You have to be open or closed. The other thing that strikes because me is... Because you're not is... even numbers, so you can't ever balance out. Oh, the, the that other th- could be a problem. Yeah, and, and they counted no data as zero. Yes. Uh, which doesn't bias it, except zero is a thing, so it's totally biasing it. Yes. Um, well, here's the thing, James. <clears throat> if, 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 if there's a species that doesn't live anywhere, then it doesn't exist. True. <laughs> but assuming that it could live everywhere. But what if it lives yeah, in You have no space. data. It's equally problematic. Well, it's dividing by zero. It's infinite. <laughs> Um, in space. The other, in space. The other problem thought space I had. Space cats. <laughs> no, we're not naming the space cats. We already named something else space ducks because of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cats in, in space. space. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm going to get Mr. Man a little space man costume for Halloween. Wait, why, why, why is that okay? But if I give him a cloak, apparently he wants to kill me. Because he wanted to kill you. He will want to kill you too. <laughs> I know that. I'm not arguing. So that what is what is your costume going to be? I don't know. I'm going to be an SVP. What the hell? Do you I should I get do? one of those little oh. cat-sized Halo helmets. You could be. Yeah. He could. Be, you could dress him up as a spaceman, and then you could be like a Trek girl or something. Yeah. Except I'm not going to. I'm, I'm going to be half of the continent away from him. So do I have to dress him up? Yeah. No. You just have to feed him. Okay. And dress him up. And dress him up. 
<laughs> Your cat's going to be so pimping when you get back. <laughs> Come, wait, wait, wait. You're just going to give him like a giant purple hat with a tinsel, feather in lots it? Lots of tinsel. Okay, lots of tinsel. okay. I, I have to tell this story. I, I'm pretty sure I've told you. I don't know if I've told you. Okay. My dad had rotator cuff surgery um, six months ago or so. Okay. So it's somewhat humorous related. How it is somewhat humorous related, except <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's it's um, a somewhat humorous story. Oh. Jesus. So... It's a very painful experience. So they had him on really, really powerful narcotics. Mm-hmm. And so I called to see how he was doing. And, and I was talking to mom. And, and s- somehow we got on the topic of how James had dressed my cat up in a cape. I don't know how we got there, but we did. And, and all of a sudden I hear in the background, Carrie, 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 Carrie. And, it's, that's my, and it was my dad. And mom finally goes, what, Meryl? And he goes... I found Burble's costume. Okay, what is it? And I, I hear this shuffling noise and mom's looking over dad's shoulder. It's a chicken costume. I'm going to buy this for him right now. I got to go. I'll talk to you later. And so when I told him this story, somehow mom talked him out of it. He was literally poised to buy this thing so off of this, eBay. This was a, this was a cat-sized chicken costume. It was a cat-sized chicken costume. Is this just going to confuse the cat into wanting to eat itself? I'm not sure, but Imagine he was so excited about it. Imagine the pictures if you could have put him up in your chicken talk. Oh, dear God. <laughs> and so when I talked to him about this, I think three months later, he had no recollection of it at to all. To be fair, you do that a lot as well. But he has a better memory than I do. <laughs> And he was, I mean, he was really high. <laughs> talking, talking of animal costumes, I've been to the farmer's market before and seen uh, pugs dressed as bees. Yeah, okay. I've, I've, I've seen, like, internet pictures of pugs dressed as bees. I saw an internet picture as a pug dressed as Yoda. That also works. I mean, they're basically already Yoda. Look at the face. The best thing on the world is doggles. Oh doggles? my god, yes. Doggles are amazing. What is a doggle? It's goggles for a dog. That, so when Aviator you go, goggles yeah, for wait, a dog. So when you go biking with your dog? And then you can give him a little leather cap and a, and a scarf. You just want to Amelia Earhart your dog? Yes. Not quite. I don't want him to disappear. Okay, fine. That's a fair point. Can you imagine a corgi uh, in doggles so and a scarf? Tra- I know. <laughs> Okay, anyway, sorry, um, what were we talking about? Uh, Biotas. I'm, Biotas, yes. Biomes. So, yes. so we talked a little bit about how they divided up the habitats, and we talked a little bit about the raw data, and so basically their analysis was statistically trying to collect them together. Mm-hmm. And I guess if we want, we can take a bit of a break and then get back to actually talk about what they did. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Good. Cool. Uh, welcome back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you never went anywhere, I guess. But we did. We well, did. Sort of. We we had. We went to a magical place. A magical place a with magical delicious pr- brownies yes, that I could eat, cream. and ice cream that was delicious and amazing, and chocolate sauce that was delicious and amazing. And all yeah. of it, James could eat. Except well, except the brownies. the brownies. Oh, that's right. You couldn't have the brownies. I know I'm it's sorry. okay. I'm a second class citizen. It's okay. Well, to be fair, she thought you could have them, and then it turns out you couldn't. I know it's okay. It's all good. So she was thinking of you. It was the best of all intentions. Yes. yes. But the worst of all executions. Yes. Well, no, the worst of all executions is hanging, drawing, and quartering. Good call. No, well, it depends. It depends. It really does. <laughs> wait, wait, what? It depends. It depends? I mean, hanging, drawing, first of all, how are we... How are, how, we... How are you going to get... Okay, are you also going to light them on fire to make are it we... even worse? I mean, uh, the big question is, first of all, what are you considering a good or bad execution? Well, preferably what? one that ends quickly with as little pain as so possible. So you're thinking of it from the perspective of the criminal that deserves to be killed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> No, you see, now that's wrong. That's not the <laughs> point of an execution. Okay, please, James, educate us. Traitors. Okay. <laughs> much like yourselves. Okay. I knew that, was, I knew that coming. was coming. It's okay, you have immunity. <laughs> you have immunity? Yeah. My family wasn't even here. Never mind. That's true. That's why you have immunity. Oh, great. Anyway, so yeah, so there's that, there's that aspect which you need to consider as well. And there are probably much worse ways as well. The Jap- Chinese probably have... Various. Well, there, there's definitely like the torture method of things. bamboo, yeah. like oh, growing yeah. underneath someone until yeah. it grows out of them. But I don't think you oh, die you know, from that. Some... Didn't MythBusters do that once? Yeah, I, literally. Totally yeah, I'm possible. sure they literally yeah. did just yeah, strap they, someone down they, and grow bamboo. Well, they did, but they did ballistics gel. But still, um, I was gonna say, remember when they took Grant, just tied him down, and then I the like bamboo Grant. Shoot. 
I just realized I don't have a Grant themed ringtone. I have an ad- I have two Adam ringtones, Jamie ringtone, a um, Tori ringtone. I don't have a Carrie ringtone either. Okay. I found a video with all these um, quotes from Mythbusters, and I I totally like just ripped all of them ripped and a whole bunch ringtones. of them into ringtones. Yeah. So I reject your reality and substitute my own. Yes, I reject your reality and substitute my own. Um, I have Jamie wants big boom. No, no, no I have okay. I have. Well, there's your problem. Well, there's your problem is a classic. Um, I have. Um, we are abandoning here all com- listeners that don't watch Mythbusters. I know. Aren't we? Yeah. Here here comes chaos. <laughs> well timed. <Is, laughs> Here comes here comes chaos is one and then the other one that I have is um Adam go it's from one of the pirate themed episodes where Adam goes let's pillage and, okay, then, yeah. and then Tori goes I don't think that's legal in California yeah and I think I have oh I also have one that's Tori saying this is starting to seem like a bad idea I'm, I've always been a fan of aren't trace arounds illegal yes I couldn't <laughs> find that one though that's a good one trace arounds yeah. <laughs> Well, they, they are illegal. They are very yeah. illegal. <laughs> I'm going to have to find that one and you and, and take that one. Do you know what they, well, I mean, the point is not to hit someone with them, but if you hit someone with them. Yeah. Well, I mean, what you essentially have. I mean, phosphorus is illegal. It's been illegal since. Um, well, it's part of the Geneva Convention, right? Yeah. I thought, no, 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 no. Because no, you used, used it in, in Vietnam. World War II. You used it in Vietnam. That's why it's illegal. Oh. Because you used it in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Vietnam was fun. Yeah, mm. and th- that's yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's sure. let's not go into. I nearly that. started a conversation about conscription, but I realized that was a conversation we didn't have on the podcast. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, that yeah, was forced conscription. Yeah. I was like, that's yeah, because yeah, I mean, basically, that's what we'd end up doing. It's like, oh, we're just going to use them for, um, you know, just day to day stuff. So they've got something to do. Oh well, all our troops are tired. We really need to have this war. So, so you guys. As, so as far as this forced conscription thing, it's like not a draft. It's literally you. Uh, well, like like Sweden, where Spain. Uh, not Spain, Spain. Yeah, and um, I think Switzerland is the Switzer- same. Way too. I thought Finland Sweden's did not, too. Uh, you might be Switzerland. You probably just have to go and guard the Pope. Yeah, you've got to go and do that for three weeks, and you can go home. I think something like that. There's a couple of countries that have. Um, South Korea does too, I think. Yeah, where you well, are. I mean, there's a very good reason for well, that. Well, yes, but. <laughs> so that was the idea? If you're unemployed, you just automatically go to From the what army. I hear. Okay. From what you hear? From what I hear. Yeeps. Um. Anyway. Cats. Cats. Cats are great. They are. Cats are great. Cats don't have wars. Cats just yes, kill they everything do. they see. They, d- <laughs> they fight with hyenas all the time. That's why cats are pissed by the way. Because of hyenas? No, no, fell cats, because cats used to lord it over dogs. Cats were like, biomass-wise, twice as big as dogs for the entire evolution of history. Now we're going to be small and rubbish, and dogs are like, well, yeah. that's why cats are pissed. Dogs are such douchebags. I love dogs. Bags, I think this is a continuation of a conversation we already had at some point. Probably. Yeah. My cat's so, awesome, though. Well, yes. He's, he's also still a douchebag, but he's awesome. Oh, he is a douchebag. He, I, mean, I, I was, cat, I was, was just redundant. I was grading labs this morning, and he decided these look comfy. I'm gonna lay on these, and then I was like, "That's nice." And he's like, "I'm gonna drool all over them too." I'm like, "That's less nice." So I had to like shove him off the labs until before he drooled all over them. He's missing teeth. Okay. And so it, it means he's more of a drooly cat. Yeah. If, so he's a drooly jowly cat. He is a drooly jowly cat. He's missing one upper canine and one lower canine on opposite sides. So it makes him extremely drooly. When one time James came over and uh, we had another friend over and the three of us had him drooling so much there were just strings of drool coming out of his mouth. It was like a dog. It was kind of gross. Okay. And by kind of, I mean really, really gross. So it was gross. It was really gross. Gotcha. Cats. Yep. Topics. So they took the humorous... And they combined that statistical data with their their assessments on where the habitat would be and tried to see if there were statistics. What the hell are you doing? He's being a cat by trying to use the pop filter to adjust his glasses. Oh, I thought he was like trying to mark it or something. Yeah, he's marking it with his scent glands. <laughs> Okay, that's um. That, <laughs> oh God! Uh, no, no, stop marking people, James. <laughs> that's um. That's his pop filter now. That that's you know what? Especially is mine anyway. It always was. I think that's from day one. He started licking it. 
We well, I I mean I have had some of the other mics sometimes. Um, Dear God, you mean but, you've tasted some of the other mics, but you just prefer this I one? I mean, but no, but I mean this one, this one. Yes, uh, Amanda had on the first day, and then after that, we always gave it to me because I was still popping through the pop filter. It's true. Oh uh, yeah, but that that got adjusted through time. It did. We learned mm-hmm. how to do this. Yeah, yes. I, I was forcibly trained. <laughs> yes, unlike My, a cat. I was gonna say yes. Unlike a cat. Unlike a cat. I don't think you can train a cat to do anything. You totally yes, can. You can. You can train cats. They'll oh, come yeah. to names, and you can teach them to uh, you, you be can... good, or you put them in the fridge and stuff like that. Be and, good, or you put them in the fridge. Okay. Well, and some of them can do agility and things like that. There's cat agility. Some of them Wait, can there do are cat agility trainings. Yes, yeah. it's amazing. Really? Yes. Her cat would not Is it do just it. like no, jump would... over this, and the cat goes no? No, you like <laughs> you can you can coax them with a feather toy, and they'll actually jump over obstacles, run through hoops. The difference is rather than rather than being trained to know there's a reward at the end, they have to see the reward. Yes. <laughs> Um, and it's so, mostly certain breeds that are really good at it. Um, so it's it's like the cookie. Uh, it's like the marshmallow test. Cats are the kids that eat the marshmallow immediately. It's like yes. tying a Twinkie on a stick and sticking it to the head of a fat kid. Yeah. <laughs> or or just a literal Twinkie because my old cat loved Twinkies. Yeah, I mean to be fair, he was talking about a literal Twinkie that he was tying to a head. I know. I'm just saying. Twinkies can work with cats, too. We're doing too. that thing where we repeat the same thing and try to pretend we're disagreeing. No, okay, gotcha. No, because you were saying a fat kid. Yep. We don't need to repeat that, but... <laughs> <laughs> there, there are things James says that don't need to be repeated because James says them and immediately wishes he hadn't. <laughs> so, like, everything? No, some of the things are good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Um, so... So cats. Cats. So cats. Cats. And, yeah. And environments. And yes. So where, aside from, okay, so at some point I'm going to have a brief discussion about some of the ways they've blocked the environments, and I think that there might be problems with that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then there's also the results bit, which you guys might be slightly more qualified to discuss, because I I got the point that it worked, but aside from that, I'm not entirely sure what I was meant to be getting out of that. Well... The results get interesting because they're very yeah. honest about what happens. And in a lot of ways, and it's kind of, that's cool. There's probably a signal there, but maybe it's something that we can't really always use. Yeah, this paper is interesting in that they are very upfront about their shortcomings. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate that immensely. Yeah, that's something that I have to admit you don't it's, usually it's, it's, see it's the, in it's papers. It's the perfect proof of concept paper, and it's yes. very rarely gets done, mainly because it's a lot of work. You could theorize on something till the cows come home, or you could do a Hell, very I've done it. <laughs> or you could do a very focused study that miraculously shows exactly what you wanted it to show. But doing an honest, open, broad case study and then presenting everything that you did is very rare. And yeah. I mean, the the habitat classification system that they use is admittedly one that was previously mentioned by other authors of the paper in a subsequent paper. Yeah. Or yes. a previous paper. Previous sorry. paper. So that does, you know, th- there is potentially a cart in, they have a cart in that race. They that, do, but to be fair, but they're this very is upfront also, and honest about it. They're upfront and they honest, it. and also these are subdivisions that are fairly standard yes. when yes. you're looking at, um, Guild. uh, guilds? Uh, guilds or, um, I, I, I don't really, I hesitate th- to use the word ecophenotype, but, it, this is they use the word ecophenotype. They a call lot. it ecomorphy. Yeah. Ecomorphy. Yeah. Yeah. But they're they're not using that word correctly. Um because ecomorphy is where you get um okay, I'm gonna slaughter this because it's been a while since I read T J. Slaughter, paper. slaughter, kill, do whatever. Um Ecomorphy is where you get um essentially the environment and okay, that's essentially the ecology, so so like saber tooth cats. Is it convergent great. evolution? It's essentially convergent evolution, but it's driven by ecology. Okay. Whereas an ecophenic, whereas an ecophenotypic variation is when you have one species that is expressing a different morphology based on environmental pressures yeah. with yes. no genetic impetus. Yes. yes. Like they have the genetics within them to express both. Yes. So e- so like saber tooth cats are a great example of e- of ecomorphy. You get it over and over again in completely unrelated groups. Okay. Um, and it's just a 
essentially a response to certain environmental Well, pressures. in that respect, then I think they were right in using the phrase ecomorphy because they're not talking about ecophenotypic variation. They're not talking about within species variation. They're talking about convergences of form, that the humerus has this form convergently because it's occupying a similar niche despite the fact that it's multiple species. But I'm hesitant to use that still because it's these animals are all rather... How many beers have you had? I'm fine. Um, generally, we use the term ecomorphy to cross wider um, oh, okay. so gaps. You're, you're talking you're, about what you're, so what you're outside saying, of what you're saying, yes, what you're, outside what of... What you're saying is that because Philidae are a clade that's so closely related, you can't tell what's occurring because of parallelisms... Or, as, as, as opposed, as, or, 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 and this is one of the big things. If you find something with short limbs, it might be, uh, which you gen they say the shorter ones are generally enclosed environments, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, there's no, there's a problem with that statement too. Anyway, there's, that there, I'll there's get something to I want to get onto that as well. Yeah. But you don't know how much of that is because it comes from an ancestor that lived in one environment and it's moving into another as let's, opposed let's to. Let's back up a, a second, just really quick. We mentioned parallelism earlier, and we didn't. Yeah, define we should. It we should define all, that. So, go. Okay, I'll say it, and then Curtis can explain it properly. Um, Parallelism is essentially a re -expre uh, an expression of something which is, um, has got the same genetic uh, background because they're closely related groups, except that it's not expressed in every member of the group. It's just it, it almost turns on and off sometimes yeah. um, uh, just because it's, it, there's a predilection for it. Yeah, so, so I guess in, in like phylogenetics, we, we typically try and group things together in, with, sing with single characteristics that evolve and then define clades. Like mm -hmm. it you have this one trait and then everything within there has that one trait. Sometimes you'll get, I mean, it's an ideal, ideal world. Because that's, that's, why, that's, that's why I say as much as people in our lab complain about Ed's statement that true homologies are very rarely found, he's completely right. He is. I mean, <laughs> things turn on and things turn off. Yeah. The characteristics evolve and don't. But whatever. The, um, the key factor, though, is that often when you get two things that look similar but they don't define evolutionary groups, there's two reasons for it. Either you've got like ichthyosaurs and dolphins, which have both converged on a tuniform shape. They look like fish. Right. Uh, and they've converged on that due to convergence. They've, there's possibly an ecomorphy that, yeah, to that, it. That's yeah. Where sort of they're an, in a similar habitat, so there are certain forms that just only work yeah. in that habitat, mm -hmm. and so that just happens to or be Almost optimally they, work in that Or habitat. most optimally work yes. in that environment. And so that's what they came down to. Whereas other examples, as James was saying, you might have a characteristic that is linked to a certain developmental process or a part of the genetic code that due to mutations can flip on and flip off within the ancestry. So within things that have a deeply rooted, in a way, a parallelism is representative of like a deeply rooted homology. It's something that is shared among them, but it never defines clades because it just keeps switching on and off. Eyes are actually one of the, the, the best examples of this. They're all using the same Pax8 gene. Even though eyes look very differently, they have the same genetic source code essentially yeah so we're all using the similar genetic source code to create yeah. eyes but we're doing it in so many different ways yeah. The, yeah. the cephalopod eye can be completely yeah. different from the human eye or the arthropod eye but yeah. I, i'm a firm believer that you could tell true convert you'll always be able to tell true convergence because they'll be modifying different existing structures to try to do the same thing whereas parallelism can be much harder yeah that, that, that makes sense but yeah, yeah. so it, so, yeah, it's possible yeah. that some of these forms, because these things are so closely related, these could be more examples of parallelism than actually examples of Or because of they're so closely related, yeah. we're seeing things poorly fitted for their environment because they're evolving out things from different environments. Well, that's also true. Yeah. Is we How much of this is things that just have to live in this environment and their ancestors mm -hmm. were in a different environment, and so they're transitional. Yeah. yeah. The, there, are, there are a couple of other things that I thought would be worth mentioning one one being um the difference between climbing in trees and climbing on rocks because would rocks technically be a more open environment if you're looking at cliff sides but you're going to end up doing this, a lot of the same thing well the, the the problem that i mostly had with this with the implication that short limbs mean an arboreal or, or closed environment yeah. um that's not necessarily the case what Short limbs represent in in the um, the dirk toothed cats is ambush predation. Okay. 
And how do we come to that conclusion, seeing as none exist today? Well, yeah, I'm very interested in that too. Well, okay. I mean, there there are ambush cats, and I understand it because short limbs are very good thing yeah. for pouncing. Yeah, yeah. That um, I think I, I, it's been a really long time since I read Larry's paper on this whole thing. Okay. Um, but. Yeah, I, I think it essentially he did the whole functional morphology of the limbs uh-huh. and looked at, you know, muscle yeah. where the muscle things. attachments yeah. would go. Yeah, and that's the other key thing. They don't take into account muscle attachments. Muscle attachments can make a limb that looks very different, behave very differently. Yes. Um, and so when you look at, um, and then when you look at dirk tooth cast versus scimitar, scimitar tooth cats, you look at the leg, limb proportions. And the longer limbs of the scimitar tooth cats are more similar to. Um, running predators, chase, chase, okay. um, not chase predation. What's that? pursuit predation? Pursuit. Uh-huh. Pursuit. Um, versus the shorter limbs of the dirk tooth, which are ambush predation. Mm-hmm. And this actually sort of makes sense if you look at the scimitar tooth, the big canine of Barbophilus. It's actually longer than the radius in the forearm. Okay. Um, which is kind of horrifying if you think about it. Um, and so these are really stumpy, very powerful animals. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's why people have hypothesized that some of these really big saber-toothed cats were taking down young mammoths. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So, but the thing about ambush predation is the, the areas that we see ambush predation now are generally open. Because that's the other big thing, okay? Open doesn't always mean open. If you look at Africa, that's a lot of open savanna, fucking tall grass. Very yeah, tall grass. Um, and leopards occur there. Leopards climb trees. Leopards are also primarily ambush predators. This was my other big thing. If you look at the open open uh, savanna of Africa, you have three general cats. Leopards, which are ambush predators and climb trees. Mm-hmm. Lions, which are ambush slash pursuit predators that hide in grass. And cheetahs, which have really long legs and are open pursuit predators. Yes. All three will probably plot out in different grades based on this scale, potentially. But they yeah. all inhabit the same environment, essentially. Yeah. One thing I will say as far as the muscle attachments, um, I'll agree with you that it could potentially cause problems, but... Again, within the context of what the paper was trying to do, the paper was trying to see if all we have is this data, mm-hmm. can we right. get anything? Yeah. yeah, and the problem with a lot of the muscle attachments is that you will have enormous muscle scars that will go halfway down the humerus. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, if you look at um, the humerus of a lion, you literally do have this one big muscle scar that runs from pretty much the proximal end, the end that's close, mm-hmm. all the way down to about halfway down the humerus. And don't ask me what muscle attaches there right now. I can't remember. It might be the biceps. Nor does anyone here <laughs> I know, able to but actually... It bothers me that I can't remember. I know it bothers you, but you don't um, have to do your comps anymore. So. Yeah. The only, peop- the only people who are going to know are James and myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So, um, but it... And our fam. And our, <laughs> our, 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 hey, our listener. Hey, Ants. Um, so, uh... So, yeah, these are features that you can't always see. They're features that make it weathered away. Um, muscle scars can be tricky um, because they, they can have morphological variation between individual specimens as well. So, anyway, I, I guess do we want to just get into the basics of the nitty-gritty of the of what they get for the results? We, I mean, wanna... yeah. we can do If you guys want to help me, because as I say, I went through this and got sw- swarmed by tables. And I was like, okay, this is cool, but I, I can't, I don't have enough time to delve into all this data. One thing I did think was very interesting, and this is the cool thing, because it's a very close study. They, they applied fossil data to see what you can get from fossils, but the main body of the study was taking animals that we know where they live, yes. taking just the measurements, and then applying it to see if we can tell where they live. And they had a very high accuracy rate. By yes. and large, well, they, they were. It was interesting because everything was around seventy to sixty-five percent mm-hmm. accuracy. Mm-hmm. So it was definitely greater than random. Chance. So, yes. so, you, so, yeah. There is a signal there, but it's not a perfect signal. No. Uh, and they divided up all of their tables within, like, uh, whether or not they did measurements from the entire humerus, whether or not they did ratios, whether or not they did it based upon various parts, I, I and then also. How it classified for each habitat classification, whether or not it was their plus minus system, just what the experts say, uh-huh. or the two GIS systems. Yeah. And what they found is that their plus minus way gave, with like all humorous data gave the highest percentage success rate. 
yeah. yeah, for what they had, whereas Although the I, lower ones were the GIS stuff. And I will have to admit that I was very thrown off at first by the fact that they used meth for methodology. <laughs> I think, I, were you just I, thinking about a cook? Vaguely, I may have been, yes. Okay. I, 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 I suspect the reason GIS appeared to perform so poorly is because of the bandbox system and they're catching a lot of habitats things weren't inhabiting within the radius they I, I think creating. that could very well be, is that if these things are only living in the forested areas and they've got to connect some sort of environment. One thing that they did do, which I thought was interesting, is that in their GIS studies, they had like a, a huge area shaped of, uh, of the entirety of carnivora mm -hmm. so that they could potentially take out outliers like if their bounding box fixed themselves out of the area of carnivora they'd be <clears> like yeah no that's probably not there <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was interesting uh -huh. yeah. but yeah I, I agree with you there's probably yeah. a little bit of slop in the gis stuff i think yeah. the other thing as well is it'd be very interesting to take rather than the open closed or mixed take the original values of tundra plain forest deciduous and see if you can get a correlation through that even well, though that's probably more risky because you're going to get a lot of bleed in where you might it, it could be either tundra and, well, or and, plains and, or, and, yeah. and we touched yeah. on this a little bit but this is something that i think i mean accidentally touched on it because you, you confuse gis with ecological niche yeah. modeling but we could totally and which is i mean uses gis exactly yeah. that's where i was going wrong yes um but uh you could totally use an ecological niche modeling to uh estimate maybe a little bit more accurately or, or get a little bit more fine-tuned estimates of these various areas. I mean, granted, they wanted to do something where they could compare to the fossil record like directly, and it's sometimes difficult to maybe take some of their fossil data and get proxies for, mm -hmm. for what they need. But if you did generate, uh, basically, ecological niche modeling takes uh, environmental variables and then uses occurrence data to create a model to estimate where these things could potentially live. And I guess the key thing there, though, is it's where they could potentially live, so they might not be yeah. living there the yes. other problem with that is environmental niche modeling takes to take tends to take very quantitative data so it'll be like chemical balances and temperature gradients exactly. and stuff like that mm -hmm. and what we're looking at here is this semi-arbitrary parceling of environments but the interesting thing you could do with that is let's say you bound box to let's say 60 percent chance that it could be there uh -huh. and you create a shape file and then you use that new shapefile, which could actually not just be contiguous. It could be a series of little blips across the world. Map on your, your actual area, or that, that little map of all the biomes, and then see how it intersects. That might get past your problem of these three things are in the only three forests, but there's a huge grassland between them. You would actually see, ideally, three little yeah. separate blips of forest. The The... I wonder if the reason they've avoided it, other than the fact that it's probably time, very time-consuming and more time than they, they had. And by the way, 60% is probably a really, really bad number to go for, but I just threw it out of my ass. Yeah. Um, like, like any of us know the difference. This is going to be that one guy, like 20 years down the line, when this is somehow on like a horrible part of the internet that nobody goes to anymore. I mean, like it isn't already. It's a horribler. <laughs> Keep going. You had something. Um... They were very interested in the predictive power of the skeletons. And if you yes. do that, you're going to show very clearly that the predictive power is limited because there might be microhabitats within the broader habitat is what the, this is what you're looking at. That's true. So what you're essentially saying by doing that is that admitting that the world is more complicated than a strict three-tier biome system, <laughs> <laughs> and that there's going to be very limited to use for, for what they're, they're testing. You mean yeah. as far as whether or not the world can be imagined as closed, open, or mixed? Yes. Mixed. I'm sorry, that that's mean. I mean, everything's vaguely mixed. There's always going to be one tree. Yeah, exactly. It's that one tree no one goes to because they know there's a leopard in it. Yeah. <laughs> that one leopard's got to be really hungry. Actually, to be fair, after a little while, that leopard is nothing but bones. That's true. I mean, and that's the other interesting thing. You, you, you definitely get things in really bizarre habitats because of either population pressure or they're young and stupid and having to disperse and stuff like that. Well, but that's all minor. We're looking at geological time. Things like that's that's minor that's wobbles. A blip that yeah, I mean, radar you, although you I would love throw to know. Things like the Living Dead, where places can they, things can live there, but they can't reproduce. I'd be there, interested so to see if things like the La Brea Tar Pit show a true cross section of plains animals, or is just a conglomeration of anything that could get there because they knew there was food. 
That's it's the latter. That's it's the latter. That's yeah. why there's yeah. so many predators. Yeah, yeah. it's a. Redi- I mean, they have what three thousand dire wolf skulls. Yeah. yeah. So how Malaria? many of those things were coming out of forests because they knew there was food there and they really needed? Totally. Food. No, no. Oh, that, yeah. that, that's no, the yeah, assumption. That's, like, there's yeah. even yeah. examples of some things that were like partially eaten and then that dude died. So you need to be aware of what source your data is coming from as well and doing all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so. but I mean that's that's a trap. Like. That's not actually literally. That's literally a trap. That that's well, there there are certain traps like natural trap cave in Wyoming that could be considered more true because true cross section because, because it's a giant just hole in the quick ground. Quicksand. Quicksand. What? It's a trap. Quicksand could be a completely unbiased trap of anything that was living on the ground. It could be. Also, Amanda knows how quicksand forms. So. I know how quicksand forms. Why is why why is this a little joke between you two? Because that's what Rick asked me on my comps. Oh, he so said back to comps. He said I'm gonna step out of your comfort zone here. And Pete, before at my practice comps, had quizzed me on things like fluid flow velocities nice. and ridiculous shit that I had no idea what the fuck he was talking about. And I literally just stood there staring at him going, I don't know any of those words you just used. And so I'm standing there freaking out thinking, oh my god, he's going to ask me something about poor pressure and flow velocity and I'm just going to stand there and go, duh. And instead he asked you about liquefaction. No, he asked me, if this is the exact question he asked me. If a bird walked across quicksand, what kind of traces would it leave? Body fossil. <laughs> so... I just looked at it for a minute and I said, Rick, stop me if I'm wrong, but quicksand is when you just have grains of sand just floating in water and they're not touching. It's, that's, it's, where, it's where a liquefaction... It's liquefaction. Yeah, it's, it's, it's liquefaction. liquefaction. It's, where, it's where a mud flow has pooled, basically. Essentially. Yeah. And so you get totally isolated sand grains yeah. and they're just in water, suspended. You manage to get just the right amount of water so that sand behaves like a liquid. Yes. And and so and saturated sand is when the grains are touching, but all the pore space is filled with water. And he just looked at me like I'd hit him in the back of the head with a board, and he said, "That's right." But the answer was body fossil. No, I, and so I said, "So you have two possibilities: either the bird won't care, and there will be no tracks because it's yeah. too elastic. So you've got like a jacana or something with a huge feet. It's just gonna walk across that leg." I don't care. I Did you do that in your comps? No, Did I Did you didn't. actually go hoodie hoodie? No, okay. hoodie no, she was too hoodie stressed. Hoodie I'd already hoodie. had to no. wrangle her committee for her beforehand. So. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, he did. Where the hell is Paul? Where's Nobody can find Paul. James is calling Paul. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I, I, my entire day was just devoted to making sure she survived her comps. It was the yes. worst day I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You've had worse. Yeah, my own. Where I couldn't answer questions on my own stuff. Yeah. Well, I, actually, that's, that's to a To be lie. fair, I wasn't here for that one. It's not my no, fault. I, I would say, or it's a body fossil. Can you can you can you draw a uh, the two cells? Yes. Draw the two shells. Draw you? the two cells. Yes. Go on. Okay. Here's, wait, wait. Here's a prokaryote, and all the DNA is just there. And here's a eukaryote, and there's the nucleus, and there's what is the what is the DNA in a prokaryote called? Shit. Yeah. What's that ring of DNA called? That's totally interchangeable and collectible. I know this. Uh-huh. What's the other thing in the eukaryote? Fuck. Yeah, what is it? Fuck. Yeah. No, I know this. It, it, it's, a, it's a key part of Bioshock. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a key part of, like, everything. <laughs> God damn it. What are the things that are in eukaryotes beside the Organelles. Got... Yeah, ribosomes, organelles. Yeah. Yes. God damn you it. You tried doing it's... that when you just had to explain what difference between open and closed systems to people that should know what fucking open and closed systems are. <laughs> Fuck. What's the difference between an open, a closed, and a mixed system, James? <laughs> I swear to God, I know this, and this is gonna bother me. All right, what 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 is the uh, what is the fourth stage of matter? Plasma. plasma? Yeah. Now add an it at the end. That plasma. Oh yes, plasma! <laughs> God damn it, I knew that. Do you know how to make plasma? Uh, Microwave foil. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Let's do that. Microwave, no. a, microwave <laughs> a cap Capri Sun, and you get this green ball going doom 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 until everything just goes. In your own damn microwave. You know, my microwave's going to die soon. Yeah, good. Got, that's oh, a great way to make I've plasma. I've got a second one, if you want it. You have a second microwave that's going to be nothing but the plasma den? No, she could microwave her, her old one, and then she can have my one. Wait, she's going to microwave her old microwave in your microwave? No, my head's probably a bit small, actually. You probably might not like it. But we can do something outside. Yes. <laughs> something away preferably from, outside. Away from houses. In the department. We're not going to do this in the department. That fire was completely unrelated. <laughs> 
time compression. <laughs> okay. So uh, <laughs> open, closed, and mixed. Mixed. Right. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is, could you tell me how many mixed results did they get? Ooh, uh, that, I that's, don't remember, actually. Yeah. The thing about it is it depended on what they were trying to classify. Yeah, I mean, it, it depended on which method they used. And a bit, I mean, they tended, there wasn't a, a, like a higher proportion of mix than they were expecting compared to what they actually thought. Well, as I said, a potential problem is that you can only have uh, open or closed if you have an odd number of habitats you're yeah. occupying. Yeah. So that would mean... Did they... Did they tie mixed to generalist, right? Because didn't they say at the start they'd expect a lot to have mixed if people were right that apex predators tend to be generalists? Yeah, mm. like they, they started out with this this idea that um, that there was yeah a lot of talk about um, most predators and most carnivores essentially just being generalists because all they do is eat, so it doesn't really matter what they eat. They that, just need that, to eat. See, they're mistaking, they're mistaking the fact that niches can overlap when things are doing different things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're an apex I mean, predator. They got, they You'd be very specialized. Of mixed, and they got a lot of closed and a few open. Uh -huh. I think that's interesting. There was a lot of closed in their habitat descriptions and a few opens. And one of the things that they had mentioned uh, in their results is that they got the highest statistical was the highest statistical significance for open and mixed assignments in A, but not for closed. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, it was something like that. Okay. And the majority of their specimens were closed. I'm okay. really, well, I, I'm really the, thrown off that in their Habitat C percentage, Asinonyx, which is a cheetah, yeah. came up as 50% forest and 50% grass. That you do get forest cheetahs, but here's the other thing. And yes, that's, that's totally bizarre. And that but, might also be, as James had yeah. put it, you've got a forest in between ranges where you yeah. aren't, and you're just going to close yeah. your area. Yeah, you just close here's the, gap, the other problem. Yeah. You're using modern cats. The ranges of modern cats have been pushed to the fringes because humans like to live where they live. Yeah. So think, a lot of animals that might live on plains are now living in forests, and they might get that kind of messing up. I mean, this is a Catch-22 issue. Because you're, you're trying to use the modern as a means to calibrate for the past, but we are always acknowledging that we've kind of yeah. fucked with I mean, the we, we killed everything on the plains in America, and now you've got mountain lions, which, let's face it, probably had a much bigger range than they do now. They didn't always just, just live in mountains. Tigers tend to live in remote jungles because we kill them if they come in the, near the train lines. You know, uh, we've, we've pushed a lot of things into the dense habitats that we don't want to be in. It's true. So, and that might that might be why some of their their numbers seemed a little odd to them yeah a little close yeah. a little yeah push and close but yeah they um they got a signal as i said yeah. everything was yeah. around 70 percent um it was it was highest correct so basically they they ran their analysis their statistical analysis to try and see if there were clusters that mm -hmm. that group things together with with suspected habitats and if they used their model they had about a 70 percent accuracy for actually guessing what the where the animal would live in their broad system mm -hmm. based upon the humerus. Uh -huh. um, and that, I mean, that's the interesting thing as well. This is, I, I tend to forget when we're discussing this, they're using a single single bone. Yes. If they expand to the limb, maybe their resolution will increase. You it's know. entirely possible because yeah. then they'll have more statistical, yeah. uh, more, potentially more statistical power by having yeah. more statistical measurements. Yeah. yeah, what would be interesting to, would be to look at the ratio of, say, the the ulna to the humerus. Well, and I also actually. think adding it, I mean, it, again, it, it's sort of against what the the papers originally They wanted to do how was. much we could do with as little exactly. as possible. They yeah. wanted to see how much how much resolution you could get with as little as possible. Yeah. But it'd be very interesting to not just use the humerus, to use as much as possible yeah. because then you could see whether or not the humerus gives a conflicting but statistically significant yeah. result to everything else in the body. Because yeah. right. that would also be important information. You can do uh, phylogenetic uh, genetic based uh, phylogenetics on the wrong gene and get a really, yeah. really good well, incorrect look answer. Look, th th there are, there are I, I'm thinking of birds in particular, but there are inbuilt, inbuilt things that force bones to be certain, and it 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 could partly be because of their their evolutionary history, and it could partly be just because the genes for those don't like to vary that much. But you get a lot of variation that you wouldn't pick up just looking at certain bones in either the hind limb or the forelimb. Mm -hmm. Well, not so much in the forelimb. Oh, the forelimb's kind of. But then yeah. they, they use this me yeah. this method to test for whether or not their dirk tooth and their scimitar tooth. That's right, saber tooth. 
Yeah. They've got they've got a dirk tooth, a saber tooth, and uh, sorry, dirk tooth, scimitar tooth, tooth, and a false, false dirk tooth. tooth and a false dirk tooth, and see whether or not those mapped on to areas where we would expect them to be given our previous reconstructions of them. And I think like three of them were right on, more or less. They they became they were overwhelmingly open, right? Yes, like over- they had the biggest purport. That like it was all they were the those tables were the only ones where like almost everything was lumped into one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, that was yeah. Sorry, everything kind of fell apart. Um, yeah, that was that was one of the things that was very interesting is that they they suggested that they had really good statistical power for really large animals being open. And they suggested that there might be an autocorrelation to that, and there might also be some problems with allometry or, you know, the way things change yeah. as they grow larger, affecting some of their statistics. Yeah. But, but they logged the data to try to avoid some of these issues. They logged the data yes. to try and avoid some of these issues. But it's still, when you're dealing with these, like, straight measures, the reason why yeah. you do a ratio is to try and remove the effects of allometry that, yeah. that could be going on there. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting that they, they seemed to get more statistical power the larger their animals were. Like size, again, size probably is a very large component of what's going on. But yeah. they're almost suggesting there that size is a large component that's forcing habitat. I could almost, um, I mean, if, if you think about it, the larger you are, the harder theoretically it's going to be for you to move around in treetops. Um, there and are, that's what they ascribe it to. Again, yeah. if you go back to that seven kilos. Yeah. Um, now, I mean, there's one, there's a stick insect on your door. There's a stick insect on my door? On There's the a stick insect on my door. Uh, yeah, put your glasses on. Look, see in the pain. <laughs> this, oh, cool. This is great for an audio podcast. Um, I'm totally going to go look at that once we're done. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we won't be long. So uh, we won't be long. There's, um, but yeah, and then there's also, so the one, one flaw is to assume that if you're in the jungle, you're moving around in the trees. Elephants live in the jungle, they do not. Yes. Um, but then the other thing as well, which is interesting to bear in mind, is um, whether or not you get allometry, which I don't know if we've explained, I think we have in a previous podcast, is variations in ratio as you grow. Yes. Essentially. Um, some things, go now, go now, otherwise it might disappear. Um, some things will start off their life in one habitat as they grow, move into another one. That's true. Oh, oh it's okay, I'm going to be back. Mantis. Okay. Well, now I'm all alone in front of the microphones, and so... They're all looking at a lovely little praying mantis, and hey, how are you doing, fans? I mean, fan. I mean, does anyone listen to this podcast? It's okay. a praying mantis. Yeah, okay. it's totally a praying mantis, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. Um, so I, what were we talking about? Like a stick and stick. That's great. Also, I mean, it's dark and far away. Yeah. Um, I, we were talking about allometry until right. James do you know, immediately. Do you know anything of, of uh, cats changing in the wild, changing habitat as they grow? No, actually, I can't. Well, no, yeah, there there are some examples. Um, for instance, young lions are are more adept at climbing than adults. Uh huh. Well, that um, that's te- that tends to, to manifest as cheetahs. an escape mechanism, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You see it? No, it's gone. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, but I mean, you do tend to see the smaller, the young, the younger a cat is, it tends to be more scansorial. Okay. And again, like James says, that's kind of an escape factor. Um, and also, like, once you get, in the in the case of lions, you get too big and too heavy and you can't get up into the tree. In the case of cheetahs, cheetahs have non-retractable claws. Mm-hmm. So by the time they get to be too old, their claws are actually so dull that they can't grip. Okay. Because the they, they literally trip and choke. Rather than yeah, no. Che- than cheetahs actually snuff. suffocate by just. Like, I mean, lions will do the same. It, almost all cats will um, bite down on the windpipe or cover the mouth. That's one of the one of the big debates about saber tooth t- t- cats. Are, are they trying to slip discs in the vertebrae, or are they trying to puncture or compress the windpipe with their with their teeth? Okay. Yeah. Um, Larry's hypothesis was always they go for the it, the vos- vessels it in the neck. It makes sense. They did they did biomechanical studies, and if you hit bone with that tooth, it almost certainly shatter. Yes. Ooh, ouch. Yes. And That's there, a bad way to go. And yeah. there but, it, are, but it fits with the behavior of every other cat on the planet. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and there, so. I mean, there are um, specimens that I think show evidence of having broken teeth. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have accidents. Um, and two of males are going to be douchebags and fight each other as well. Yeah. 
Um, but I think, because they did biomechanical studies, because some people were arguing that they went for the viscera. Okay. And it just showed that they, they can open their mouths that wide, but the, the it's sabers just gonna get tangled can't actually... And then you're gonna... Yeah, they can't actually puncture... So you can't rake effectively to get anything. They did, right, they did yeah. the same thing with the um, claws into a mare saws. Yeah. And while they can puncture, they can't be used as a slicing tool. Yeah, some of them are too compressed. In fact, people have suggested that they did the same thing. They would, they would climb up on the animal and then try to go for the, choke. Go for the jugular, yeah. yeah. Okay. So remember the knives that people use to just literally impale people's throats? Shaped exactly like a saber-toothed cat. You, you mean a dirk? Yeah, a dirk. Yeah. Or, um, what? This there, seems there's circular. Spe- there's, no, there's a, spe- there's a particular um, knife that was used in the Middle East that is shaped identically to um, like a barbophilus. Scimitar? Yeah, no, it's, scimitar. It's not a scimitar. That's a sword. I mean, yeah, no, we've named his, circular. We've his, named no, 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 these no, no, after no. the knives a lot, they a, lot of, a lot of the Middle Eastern swords were curved. There's a number of reasons for that. The other, one of the main reasons being that you didn't wear heavy armor. You wore a lot of cloth and you needed to be able to disentangle and cut your way through cloth. Yeah. I can't remember the name. I can never. It starts with a J. Okay. J. It's not a. I don't. You thinking? You thinking? Uh, Arabian Middle East. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what she's going with. I I know exactly. Well, you know, you know, shuttles, right? The. Yeah, but that's not that, it. No, no. But that's that's to go around big broad wicker shields. Yeah. Um. Jam. Um, Jam. Gem, gem anyway. Hadar. No, whatever. Um. Anyway, but it's. <laughs> It's got the watch, same. It's got the same function. <laughs> no, I did not. Nerd. <laughs> hey. It's uh, it's got the, essentially the same function. Okay. To go for that part of the throat and just yeah. bleed out. To be, if, to be gotcha. fair, when it, uh, any kind of sword has got three major points of entry, uh, it's either your throat, you're in a thigh, or under the armpit, because that's where you're going to get people to bleed out quickest. Uh, unless you're very nasty and Western European, where you'll have it heavy to break ribs, or just yes. try to floor people so that they <laughs> then die slowly. Yeah. Great, great swords are great for this. Uh, that's because we insisted on wearing heavy armor, and then if you can't get through the chain mail, you might as well just break everything underneath it. Yep, pretty bash, much. bash the shit out of things. The, the Gross Messer is one of the best weapons around. It's a, it's a German, uh, Northern European thing. It literally means big knife. But it, it, it's shaped like a falcon. It looks most closest to the Eastern European things. It cut, it just takes limbs off. So I think the interesting question here, getting things back on the topic, I guess, for one final idea, uh-huh. is the results suggest that maybe there's a signal, presuming that their habitat classification isn't just entirely spurious. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's 70 odd percent, is it usable? Is it something that we can consistently use and expect it to work? It's, like, it's one of the things they honest. actually they reference. The one thing they reference in their in their analysis is that with the fossil record, one of the problems that could be coming up because they get I think three out of their fossils, but the the rest of them don't quite fit what they expected. Um, and they they say that you know maybe their entire habitats we don't know about. Because animals could be living in entire ecosystems or habitats that we don't really we're looking, anticipate. We're looking at the Eocene. I think that's possibly stretching things a bit far. There's there's not a magical lava world that we don't <laughs> know about. Well, I mean, there there have been, there been suggestions on. that uh, even up into uh, the late Pale- uh, the, the late Cenozoic, that uh, across certain areas of like North America, the f- uh, pollen concentrations have suggested. Uh, Plant pairings that have that are never seen in the modern, so that there are certain uh, species of plants living together but that they, we usually don't see. But they were see. looking at whether it's open, closed, or mixed. You can't get much simpler than that. It doesn't matter what the plant pairings are; it's open, closed, or mixed. Good point. Yeah, good point. that's a good point. They, they have generalized things to the point where maybe that's not an issue. Yeah, I think, in all honesty, a seven per, seventy percent is pretty impressive. It's very impressive. The thing is, um, and I think that I think that yes, this this could feasibly be used. But we do have to we have to expect that it's not going to be perfect. It's a corroborating right. source of data. You'll have paleo environmental stuff from the sedimentology. You'll have associated fauna. It's not your sole source of data. It will corroborate or it might argue against, and then you will weigh all the data and make a decision based on that. Yes, I think that's a good point. Yep. Cool. Well, does anyone want to add anything else, or do we just want to keep conversations about knives? Knives are pretty cool. Maybe we just do it like a knife cool. show kind of thing, like. Uh, 
All right, so uh, over here we got this big Bowie knife. Uh, we're giving this away for the first 15 callers for $30. Huh? Have you seen the cookery? No, I haven't. They're amazing. The cookery? Cookery. Cookery. The Gurkha knives. It's the dunk, yeah. dunk designed for throwing. The dunk, dunk. Oh, that, that... It, it, it's, got a, it's got like a 45 degree bend on it. Okay. And then it widens the front. It's like a bow knife. It's designed for throwing and cutting throats and devouring and all that sort of stuff. Oh, fun. And it's also a machete. I need to get a machete. Yeah. I mean, everyone really does. I'm pretty sure VP has a machete. I know, but I need a machete. Yeah, this is personal. Oh, yeah, I know. For field work and stuff. <laughs> and stuff. Y you never know when you're going to have to hack at something. Yeah. I have a Marine Corps bayonet. Woo. It's my soil knife. Wait, what? It's my soil knife. You use a bayonet to cut soils? Uh, once. She keeps it close whenever I'm um... around. Okay, just... yeah. And then I never actually went on another soil strip, so now it's just a field knife. Cool. How does a bayonet work as a field knife? I mean, it doesn't it's, have to it's be just a knife. It's just a knife that you, oh, okay. that you bayonet can affix onto yeah. a gun. Nobody gotcha. ever does that because it's the worst idea ever. Yes. What are we talking about? It's the most amazing idea. It's ever. not. You can't shoot fucking straight, and then you've got a fucking spear. Yeah, of course. It's terrible, but it's awesome. <laughs> Why don't you just attach a chainsaw at the end? See that that would be awesome too. <laughs> this this is a tradition that worked really well when you had to reload and it took like fifteen hours. Yeah, to reload and you your did, you, and you did not affix bayonets until you're about to be charged. Before we had the ring bayonet, it was just a plug. So you fired it, then you stuck physically stuck the knife at the end of the gun and then just ran mm -hmm. at people. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, back when warfare was warfare. Back when we hired, well, I say hired. Made convicts fight for us. Hooray. No, you hired the Germans. Oh no, no, no! You see, that that was hiring Hessian mercenaries to keep the Dutch in order <laughs> in Pennsylvania, and that's why we have the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Hooray! Yay. Does that show look really bad, or is it just me? I have. I what, don't know anything about one? it. Yeah, it's probably really bad. Okay, I don't know. Oh yeah. Is it what ABC? Uh, NBC. I think. Okay, regardless, it's either ABC, NBC, or Fox. Chances are it's probably not going to be that good. It's HBO. It might be good, but it's no, uh, it's not yeah. HBO. Uh, Say HBO, possibly FX or AMC. ABC, AMC. Uh, yeah, AMC is different to ABC. AMC yes. is drastically different drastically to ABC. Different. <laughs> now that we've lost all non-Americans, <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you're slowly being Americanized. It's okay. Naturalized, if you will. Naturalized. Green card? Can has? Can has green card. God oh my damn it. god, you went back. <laughs> well done. God damn it. All right. Well, on that note, I've been Kurt. I'm Amanda. Uh, James. And we're signing off. <laughs>